What's up, y'all? I'm back with another live. I figured that me doing lives on top of writing statuses will give you a clear picture of the portraits that I want to paint with spoken word as well as visual. So that's why I do lives so often. And if it helps one person to think, then I've done my job. But anyways, so this live, I titled it, you know, Christ is worthless because of us, because I think that that's the true statement. I was in a conversation that inspired this, um, this live. And in the conversation, uh, basically, um, the person was comparing their relationship with other people that they consider their family with uh, relationships in church. And the statement was like, I'm going to vouch for the people that I rock with and respect them before I respect something that, you know, this other person has to say that's in the church because you're my sister in Christ. So basically, the, the statement hit me like, okay, you know, the term brother or sister in Christ should actually hit harder then, you know, you call somebody a brother or sister in a worldly, secular, or just loving term uh, as far as a friend sticking closer than a brother. So, I don't want to say they rub me the wrong way because that's not the right terminology for it. But I'm very observative, especially when it comes to things that pertain to the church in Christ, because that is really my heart. And I really do care about the church and I really do care about my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I really do take that statement to heart. But in majority Christian culture, when we say brother or sister in Christ, oftentimes we only refer to it when referring to who we go to church with. You know, who I sit by, what row I sit by. You know, we have everything to do with 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 um, with a church service. But on the flip side of that, you know, we we don't know our brothers and sisters in Christ's true struggles. A lot of times um, we there's a lot of feeling like we got to hide stuff from each other if we fall or, you know, we feel the need that we can gossip about people that we call our brothers and sisters in Christ. Just so many things. Or we don't have a relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, quote unquote. And yet we feel like we can step to them about an issue without having a true relationship. We feel like we have the latitude to step to them based off of uh, what we feel a lot of times. Not even according to what the word is, but we step to them according to what we feel is right or wrong, or maybe we just straight up offended and we step to them in a pseudo loving way. We step to our quote unquote brother or sister in Christ. That term is just so fake for the majority culture. Brother and sister in Christ means in today's world, oh, I go to church with this person. And it's just an undervaluation of what brother and sister in Christ is truly meant to mean. Just because you go to a person, uh, just because you go to church with a person doesn't mean that person is your brother or sister in Christ. You just go with that person. You know, this is my church associate. It might even be a church friend. But I think that we use the term brother and sister in Christ way too loosely. And because we use it loosely, the detriment is it's a it's a term of endearment. But we, we devalue Christ and the term is very, very worthless. And we make Christ worthless because we deal with each other and we slap Christ on it. When a lot of the stuff that we do in just church organization versus church organic body of believers, it puts a bad name on Christ because you got outsiders looking in saying, OK, well, this is how things work. And it really doesn't look like that. We devalue Christ, you know, like the reality is, is that if, if you are truly a believer of Jesus Christ, if you have truly been born again, every person that's been truly born again 
is part of the same person. You came from the same loins, which was the loins of Jesus Christ. Like your spirit was actually born from Jesus Christ. And, you know, in a lot of contexts, we don't really deal with each other like we're really family. A lot of times we don't really deal with each other out of the context of the gospel. One, because we don't really understand what this gospel is that we have submitted to and the implications of it. And then, you know, we just have, you know, for the lack of a better term or just to come on the step of what most people even understand. We have spiritual leaders, spiritual mothers and fathers who, you know, quite frankly, could just do a, a better job at delving into giving more context and meaning to what it means to be in the family of God more than just being in church and being a part of the same you don't like what title Adresha what title you don't like being being the same uh, being in the same uh space I mean you can go to a club and you don't have to have a club mother or father you know what I'm saying it's just I I feel and this is the utmost the utmost honor and respect that i could say i'm always trying to be honorable or respectable but at the same time i do want to make sure that we talk about things that need to be talked about so that it can bring forth change and you know just to be quite honest when i think of spiritual father or mother in terms of biblically and i look at paul and how he he calls his son timothy a son in the faith that's because he had a hand in bringing this person to Christ. And he said in scripture that he birthed Timothy through the gospel. So he has a latitude of being called a spiritual father to Timothy because he actually had a hand in birthing Timothy into this room out of the spirit. And it's, it's a gift that God gave to him so he can call him his spiritual uh, father or he can call him his spiritual son. But besides that, the point is, in a little sidebar, is that just spiritual parenthood today is it's not the best that it could be. And I say that, like I said, in the most respectful way possible. Spiritual parenthood could be a lot better when it comes to just Jesus Christ and, 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 and working and laboring in love that Christ be formed in us. You know, you got spiritual people. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. You saying Christ is worthless because of us. Maybe we make Christ look worthless or maybe I won't understand. No, I, I basically I made the title to be a trigger as well to get people to come on. You know, I just be trying to do that so that you can hear my ear. But before I made this title, I was thinking about saying that we make look we make Christ look worthless because that's exactly what the sentiment is behind the whole Christ is worthless. We know that Christ isn't worthless. However, we do make Christ look worthless because of how we just, we use him. We use these terms so lightly, brother and sister in Christ. And then we gossip about our brother and sister in Christ, or we don't have the correct relationship or don't even have a close enough relationship for us to actually trust a critique that you have of said person because we're not even close. You know, brothers and sisters in Christ should be close and there also should be an awareness that on a global sense, not just for the local church, but on a major scale, you're not just brothers and sisters in Christ with the people at your local service. I don't care if y'all go to different churches, like if y'all are all together in one building, you know, y'all are part of the same body. And that's another thing. Amen. You agree. <laughs> That's another thing. A lot of times what we see in the body is tribalism. Oh, I go to this church and I go to this church. And, you know, so because we go to different churches, I'm closer with this next person because I'm in the same spot. On the one hand, it makes sense because, you know, I'm in the same general local area. So I'm close with this person because we move in the same circles. But I feel as though Christians should have a much broader outlook and perspective of what it means to be a child of God and, and a much broader perspective than just um, I'm, I'm going to this church and so I'm close with this person. I know I, I did that so that you can come on here, Dervin. Basically, and Audrey put it on there. Christ is not worthless. However, we make Christ look worthless. And what that does translate to is 
in the eyes of the people that are looking from the outside, looking in, Christ is worthless to them. We know that Christ is of ultimate worth. We know that. That's the truth. However, in the eyes and in the hearts of most of the majority people in the world and the carnal people in the church, to them, Christ is worthless. It's like if, if I give you a million dollars, but you really don't see the, the, the worth or value of it. Yeah, it's worthless. If I give a million dollars to my daughter who doesn't know what money is or what it does to her, it's worthless. So the way that we handle Jesus, the way that we handle Christianity and the terms that we use, it's very important that we pay attention to how we handle Christ because we're teaching we're teaching onlookers in the world to handle Christ in a certain way. And so it very well could stand to be the truth that Christ could be worthless in certain contexts because of how they see him handled. You know, um, uh, example comes to mind how, you know, everybody talks about how, you know, Jesus is picked on in, in pop culture. And they say, oh, but, you know, you, you don't talk about Muhammad like that because you know that the Muslims would come out of the woodworks and they would, uh, they would come and they would defend. And they have a point. Okay, cool. You know, it shouldn't be that Christianity is satire or can be picked on just so lightly and, and nobody comes to bat and nobody comes to defend the, the reason for the hope that we have in us. You know, it, it shouldn't be like that. Like the Bible is a is a real text that covers real people over a real span of time. And it testifies of a real flesh and blood person that was born on this earth, a real soul that's a divine soul, that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the eternal one that existed, that is God, the word that was with God, the word that was God, all of John 1. Same as plug. Y'all can go read John 1. This God actually became flesh. Before a man was ever a living soul or flesh and blood soul, a flesh and blood body and an actual living soul, before a man was ever anything, he was a spirit first. It was a spirit and attention and energy of what God wanted to do in a certain space. And the same goes for God when he was made flesh. God is God. He will never change his spirit. God is spirit. So when the word became flesh, what y'all have to understand is that when the word became flesh, this was the spirit of God. First of all, forming the body of Jesus Christ in the earth and then entering into this body and a soul was created. It's not contradictory either jesus soul got its start on this earth just like our soul did so we actually get to see an actual god live as an actual man and never never lose his godness god literally became a man had a new soul a, a, a completely new soul and grew up from a baby to 30 years old, had a three year ministry and died a real death. God was made manifest in the flesh. I don't think people understand how amazing that is. God was made manifest in the flesh. The first time that the, the first time that the soul of God literally actually existed was when the word became flesh as testified in john chapter one god became a man god became a baby god cried as a baby he was born not through not through uh the seed of a man he was born from the virgin mary like he his soul is divine and his soul got a start on earth that puts a whole new spin on reading the New Testament and reading the Gospels because this is actually a real God growing up as a man. 100% God, 100% man. That, that revelation, it makes Christianity a lot, a lot more deeper. And I don't think a lot of people understand the gravity of who Jesus is. Fully God and fully man.
I went off on the trail there. So let me try to get back. But we, we, so we mishandle this whole thing about brother and sister in Christ. Like if you're in Christ, if you believe, and if you have been born again, like we are, we are relatives. And because of the gospel that we believe that we were once found in sin and unrighteousness and all this other stuff, but we believed in the gospel and we were re literally born again, we shouldn't be afraid to uncover our nakedness to anybody. I shouldn't be afraid to tell you what I've struggled with, what I still struggle with, which is the problem that most Christians have a, a problem being honest with what you still struggle with because your, your flesh is still alive and it's your job to mortify the deeds of your flesh. But a lot of times we as Christians have a hard time really revealing, revealing the actual struggles that we still to this day struggle with. And if you say that you don't have struggles, then you're a liar because you have a flesh body that's still tempted. Only difference is that you are born again and your spirit is in your body, but you have however many years you racked up before you were born again. So you have a, a, a flesh mind and you have proclivities and all this other stuff. And we want to act like we just get saved and we just, you know, you know, are oblivious to, to what our life was before. And it's not the case. You, you still have a, a sinful body. The word says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. However, he also does tell us to mortify the deeds of the flesh because we have a spirit, which is the God us. It's the God's intention of us. We have a, a spirit. But then we also have this old flesh that we continually, God tells us to mortify the deeds of it. That was another trail. But what I'm saying is, if I'm in Christ, if I'm truly in Christ, if I have truly been born again, because there's so many people that say I'm a Christian and they're not Christian because they truly haven't been convicted of anything. They haven't probably even heard the real gospel and there's been no regeneration at all within their souls whatsoever. But they know how to be good actors and they know how to do a lot of good things. But what you will find is many people that say they are Christian, they say that because they modified their behavior. They've done something to appear good. They've chosen to stop smoking, drinking, doing whatever, but they're not saved. All this happened is that you decided that you were going to try to do better. And, you know, you may be successful. You may not be. You might be pretending. Maybe that's the reason why brothers and sisters in Christ don't want to be around each other, because you know that, you know, you know that behind closed doors, you really do have some struggles that you just, you know, you haven't in, you haven't encountered the power to change so that could be another reason why we mishandle the the um the term brother and sister in christ because maybe you're not a brother and maybe you're not a, a sister like i said I, I did this post uh the other day because um it was a it was a woman crush wednesday it was a couple weeks ago and i shouted my wife out and i was like you know so i said you know a lot of people may may want you but you know i'm glad that god gave me your heart and um, I, I made a statement at the end of it. And I was like, I'm not your whole bro. And I meant that because there's like people that will work with my wife because she worked with music or whatever. And, you know, they may know or they might not know that I know that they really be making advances on my wife. And when I'm talking about advances, I mean, like, I don't care that you marry. Be my side piece. Uh you know, I wore this to look a certain way to you and just really coming at her. And I'm like, but you in the church, but you play music for a church. But you supposed to be playing behind my wife while she's ushering in the glory of God. And at the same time, you lusting after her. I find a problem with that. So I said, no, I'm not your I'm not your bro. Ho, I'm not. Yeah, I'll smile on your face. I'll say, what's up? I'm going to show you love because I don't think it's in my heart to really, you know, really be confrontational like that because that's just not my M.O. So I would I would do that. But I that doesn't take away from me feeling the way that I feel based off of what I, you know, what I hear. And just for clarity, you know, I told my wife, I'm like, yo, you know, we need to, you know, have a conversation. I need to I need to let this person know that I already know what you said. I know your intentions. And I just want you to know that I know and, and go like that. But she was felt that it was unnecessary 
I don't still agree because I feel like if, if we're claiming to be something, then we need to be that. And, and if you have enough boldness to step and to make advances at another man's wife in the church and you claim to be a Christian or you claim to touch the things of God, I feel like I have a responsibility to warn you that you're playing with fire. And I feel like we could be respectful. I feel like uh, there could be no hard, hard feelings or anything. But I just I, I feel like that's something that we should be able to do in the body of Christ. If you've done a wrong, if you've offended me, I, yeah, I want to step to you. I want to let you know that, listen, listen, man, I heard what you said uh, about my wife. I, I know what you, your, your thoughts and intentions are concerning her. And I just want to let you know that if this is to continue, that activity has got to stop. And even if it wasn't about my wife, I would hope that if it was under any other pretense, that I could be able to step to somebody that I see that's stepping to somebody else's wife or that's exhibiting worldly behavior and tell them too, hey, don't you say you're a Christian? You know, if you can't be touching the things of God and, and doing this and doing that and then exhibiting this behavior. And I think a lot of times the, the key word in church is, you know, we've taken on the key word from the world of, oh, you judging me. No, it's not judgment. It's bringing you under accountability and it is judgment because we make judgments every day. I am seeing what you're doing. I am judging it. I'm saying that that's hoish behavior. I'm saying that that's lustful behavior. So I am making a judgment. I'm also in that same judgment trying to bring con conviction that if you believe the gospel and if you say that you are a saved person, that's just not some light thing that you just say, oh, I'm saved and I can do whatever I want and just dwell on the grace of God if I mess up. We dwell on grace too much. We dwell on grace too much, very, too much. And in the Bible, in Hebrews, it's like if you trample over the grace of God, you're not even worthy to be restored unto repentance. Like we float around all these statements and all of these terms. We don't understand how serious God is about salvation. And we think that because we have grace that we can just do whatever we want and it's fine. And yeah, it's fine for now. There was a season where God winked at certain things, but it's, a, it's, really, it's really a time when God is calling people to repentance that aren't taking things serious he is you can't you can't just do certain things and call yourself a christian you can't it's never been that way it, it's it's never been that way that you can just call yourself a christian and do certain things and this is why people had a problem with what i said about cardi b but i never take it back i never will if you're a christian then you need to you need to find out all what it means to be a christian and, and be that or stop saying that you're a Christian and just be an atheist. Like my brother uh, uh, Ezekiel said, who's a poet, just be an atheist. But don't put a name on your dysfunction and call it Christian. I know that we got struggles and we need to get stuff together, but at least, at least have the basics right. At least believe in the gospel. At least believe that you are actually struggling with something and that you're not just passively struggling about it and that you're not just saying, oh, my flesh just got weak and I just, you know, failed to this. No, it's time out for that. And I've been main one to do it too, you know. You know, ultimately what it was is I just wanted to do what I wanted to do and I just did it. And my heart wasn't convicted over the gospel of God. And that's why I'm such a advocate for the gospel as well, because I feel like if that's the only thing that really is going to captivate our heart and convict the heart. Thing about it is, is that we're not convicted about Christianity. Most of the 90 percent, I won't say 90 percent, but a lot of percentage of Christians are not convicted about the gospel of Christ and not convicted about Christ. But yet we live like we are on, on surface. We go to church like we are. We have just enough relationship with somebody to where we can say, oh, you're my brother or sister in Christ. But I confide in these people that might not even be in the church or might not even be convicted. I can I confide in them more because they're more real. It shouldn't be that there's more people that in the world that's going to be more real about your situation than people in the church. But it's like so much. We got so many sanitized people in the church. We don't want to talk about nothing. I'm going to say this and I'm beyond ashamed about it. I had some trouble yesterday, a brother, um, a brother. And if you saw it, you saw it. And you know what I'm talking about. If you didn't, then you don't. That's just what it's going to be like. And it's, that's what we're going to do. But I, 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 I playfully made a post a screenshot from twitter this and mind you these are married people this is a married couple this is a, a married people that i consider a brother or sister of christ 
I made a post and, you know, they're joking about, you know, sex or whatever. I get somebody that says somebody in the church. I'm not going to call names. I'm just not going to do that. But I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about. And, you know, if you got a problem with it, that's something you got to do with yourself because it's my page and it's my life. And I can quite frankly do what I deem that I want. But if you have a problem with it, you're free to, you know, comment on this post. You're free to inbox me. And um, and that, that'll be that. But, you know, oh, it's inappropriate. Since when is it inappropriate for Christians to talk about sex, especially if you marry? That's the problem with Christianity today. We're scared to be who we are. We're scared to show the world that we actually are still people that can actually still joke in a jokingly way. If anybody is licensed to make jokes about sex, it should be married Christian people. But yet that's unacceptable because there's some kind of clause that you got to keep to make your name appear a certain way. That's that's foolishness to me. We too stuck up. We just are. Christians don't have time to be stuck up. Jesus was put on a cross for me. So that I don't have to be stuck up. So I'm not going to walk around here like I got to stick up my butt. Like I'm married and don't know what sex is. Like I can't talk and have sexual, um, sexual advice given to somebody. I'm not. I'm not going to be one of those stuck up Christians. Christ didn't get stuck on a stick for me to be stuck up. He didn't. And I'm, you can, you, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be censored. If I'm married and I feel like I want to make a sexual statement, obviously it's going to be respectable. So I'm going to make it. I did apologize because I didn't get consent to put that screenshot out there. But at the same time, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that you got to feel some type of way that I even put it out. That just, to me, it shows pretentiousness. It shows that you want to look like something to people, but then behind closed doors, you know, you want to be something else. And something else is not even bad. Like you married. You can joke how you want to joke. And if somebody feels some way about the stuff that you publicly put out, then they can talk to you, but you can still put it up because you're free and you're married. But that's, that's, that's that on that. But it's just like, man, this life has been long enough and I probably got to go and clock in in a, in a minute. I don't even know what time it is. But all I'm saying is we got to stop playing with Jesus. If, if you're my brother and sister in Christ, you got to understand that that brother and sister in Christ, it means a, a heck of a lot more than just a brother and sister in the flesh sense. It does. Like we are really one with the spirit and, and we just make Christ worthless to people. So, so I think that I would go ahead and, and restate my statement of this title that Christ is worthless because of us. That's the truth. Christ is worthless in the lives of other people, in the eyes of other people because of us. You know, he is. I don't know, you know, if I treat my car any type of way, then I'm treating people, I'm teaching people how to treat my car. If I dress any certain kind of way, if I treat myself any certain kind of way, if I look like a bum all the time, I'm teaching people to, to not value me. If I don't value me first, then nobody else is going to value me. So, so the statement goes and the statement will be repeated as true as I end this live that Christ is worthless because of Christians. Christ is worthless because of Christians, because we don't value him at the level that we need to. And we need to. I said a lot in this post and I hope my prayers that you, you know, go back and listen to it, share it, comment on it. But we need to be serious about Christ and we're not. And I think the main reason why we're not serious about Christ is because we, we find we foundationally do not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. I always bring it back to that. We don't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't understand the grace of Jesus Christ and what he has done. And we're not daily in the word endeavoring to understand. It's definitely not being talked about as much as it should be in our churches. Yet we're doing all these community works and we're teaching people how to have high credit scores. And we're teaching people how to do everything else. But we're not delving into the gospel the way it needs to be delved into. And that's something that I'm not going to let go of. It's something that I'm not going to. I'm not going to um, stop putting attention on. We need to talk about the gospel more because it's truly the only thing that's going to save. It's truly the only thing that's going to actually motivate us to not be carnal because church is too carnal. 
It just is. And it is because we're getting a carnal word. It is because we're getting responsibility shift out on us like we're supposed to do all the work. If we're supposed to do all the work, and I'll end with this, if we're supposed to do all the work, and if our spiritual development is only on us, then what the heck do we need a leader for? What the heck do I need a leader for if it's my responsibility to delve in and to produce my relationship with God? What the heck are you for? What are you preaching for? I can go anywhere and get motivational and all this other stuff, but what are you for if you're going to press all my spiritual disciplines on me? It doesn't make sense, and it's, it's a dumb argument. Christ is worthless because of Christians, and my prayer and my hope is that we will make him... Um, my Christ is worth. <laughs> I want to end on a statement. So Christ is worthless because of Christians. And my prayer is that we would show his real worth.